I've taken to fishing actually lately, you know, I like it. I had to get over a kind of anthropomorphic thing about the fish, not maybe digging a hook, ripping his mouth and stomach out. But really when I got over that, it was just easy. I'd rather, I concentrate on the drowning worm instead. <laughs> Because the fish, when you bring him into the boat, he still seems to prefer to be elsewhere. <laughs> but a worm doesn't see he's lower on the fauna chain, and for some reason he doesn't give a shit. I mean, you cut him in half, both sides walk away. How are you? <laughs> see the Yankees in that last World Series? They were great, weren't they? Throw that ball! <laughs> Run! Hit! <laughs> Bunt! Ah! Baseball's most dangerous procedure, by the way. You miscalculate right in your Monongololos. <laughs> Sorry about that, too. Career full of euphemism searching for the networks. Can we use woo-woo instead of tush? <laughs> Baseball players are a little less hardy than football players. Baseball player slides into second base. And, oh, a raspberry, an infection, out for the year, again, mercurochrome, you know. And, Football player, the doctor said, you can't go back in there, son. The bone is sticking through the skin. Well, put it back, sucker! <laughs> and, uh, the amphetamine starts to take hold around the national anthem. He gets going, uh, and the home! They're hitting each other's helmets. And, uh, and, uh, and I love the way they understate the violence, like the referees, you know, personal foul, number 22. First of all, they have to walk away. They put that mic on, and the players are screaming, you son of a... <laughs> Get the personal foul number 22, ripping the running back's head off, <laughs> breaking his legs, calling his mother fat and ugly. <laughs> 15 yards, decline. <laughs> and after they break someone's legs, and you see the players on the bench, they turn around and go, Hi, Mom. <laughs> Um, baseball is a game of fear and avoidance. My parents didn't let me play either. Slightly protective people with a slightly different approach toward child rearing than, say, Mr. and Mrs. Too Tall Jones' parents, you know, or the Flying Wallenders, for example, who seem to delight in the complete wiping out of their family and their profession. Mr. Wallender, I understand your son in law was killed last week. Yes, we're very proud. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Understand your daughter-in-law was killed last month? Oh, yes, very proud. Rump, no, on that, yes. Understand your grandson sprained his ankle? Yes, we hope he was killed next week. We hope he was. <laughs> but my parents is, what are you, football? What are you, crazy? How about checkers? What are you talking about? One of those will flip up, take your eye out. <laughs> you know what happened to that Dawkins boy. You know that. <laughs> Tennis with a helmet. You can get an abrasion on your head. <laughs> um... Besides, well, Babe Ruth, I, I just seen pictures of him. I never saw him really play, but I, I don't know, how good could he have been? He runs so funny. Uh, <laughs> there's the immortal Babe. I mean, how could a guy be that good if he did that? Eh? You see, Ty Cobb and Babe Ruth before the All-Star Game, 1934. Uh, <laughs> little our gang baseball gloves. Uh, <laughs> babe was hardy, though. He had a bad season in 1923 because of syphilis. That's not widely known, but true. You know, baseball fever, catch it. Babe caught it. <laughs> uh, probably that's why he runs that way. But, man after my own heart. 12 girls at a time, 11 hot dogs before the game. You know, you know. Rough and tough there. Um, I guess, though, baseball is a game of great fear, too. You play hardball? Oh, boy. Especially the majors. That ball's coming in 90 MPH. You have to decide in a half a second whether you're going to hit it out of the park for a home run or it's going to make you a vegetable for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. You watch your Winfields, your Schmitz, they hang in there. They're not afraid. They don't step in the bucket. They're... You watch it like a LeMaster on San Francisco. That's 117 every year. They call him a good competitor. You know, they, <laughs> they cover for him. He's a good competitor. He competes very well. Let's find a ball player for him. If we can. You watch him in slow motion. You see his problem there. He steps in the bucket. No power. That's why, to me, greatest living baseball hero of all time is Minnie Minoso, who held the record for getting hit by pitch balls. Early black Cuban player in the league, 
Played in five decades, actually. He's a coach for the White Sox. Minnie's approach was entirely different. His head was in the strike zone. <laughs> and they said, catch a good one, Minnie. They didn't mean a hit. <laughs> All right, show him first, fellas. A little dignity, show him first. You know, he'd run out the center field to third base. And... Whitey Bernstein, the trainer, runs out and sprays ethyl chloride on his head. <laughs> which is like Novocaine gone wild. He can't feel his head for a little while. And he can't comb his hair for a couple of months because he can't find it. Donde, donde, la cadera? He's looking everywhere, Minnie. You know, Sidney Poitier is doing his life story next year. It's a beautiful montage scene. You know, New York, St. Louis, Chicago. There's train tracks in beneath him. Boston. That guy gave for his team. Those days, the White Sox only had three signals. One was hit and run. One was bunt. One only for many. <laughs> Towards the end of his career, he pretended not to hear, you know. Time out! Uh, they didn't want to give away the signal. The coach would turn his back. <laughs> the national anthem is uh, still the best part, though. Everyone fidgets. And... It's a tough one. I had to sing it in an affair. When you're in numbers and you feel secure about it, you don't realize it's a four octave range, evidently written for geese or something. You know? <laughs> and the rocket's red. Forget it. <laughs> I mean, it's a great instrumental, but in fact, I knew the organist at Ebbets Field for many years, and they stole all his licks. He was a great musician. You know, da 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 da. He wrote that. <laughs> da 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 da. Fight! He wrote that, too. He's working at a lounge now at a Holiday Inn. And, uh, playing the organ, you know. And the rocket's red. I had to sing it alone. Boy, it gets you. You try to start low and fool it. Oh, say. And the rock. If you try to reverse it, you start high. Oh, say again. I still get you. And the rock. It's an old English drinking tune. I learned that on a Shell Bicentennial Minute. In 76, instead of giving us two or three cents off gas, they got these tax-deductible, self-aggrandizing commercials. But I found out it's an old English drinking tune, which explains the key. But the lyrics were written by a man eminently qualified to write lyrics for a national anthem. He was an attorney in Baltimore named Francis Scott Key. And the phrasing is amateurish. I mean, when you start off one word and go, Oh, say, what did he, thought he was a 50s doo-wop group, you know. <laughs> oh, oh, darling, you know. <laughs> Couldn't lay one note on the, oh, oh, say. And uh, also, the poem is ridiculous. I prefer America the Beautiful. Nice poem, Purple Mountains, Majesty. Nice little chill up the spine. The National Anthem, it's about a, a war we lost, War of 1812. Sorry, fellas, don't like the disillusion. We were taught in school we won it. We got smeared. <laughs> They burned Washington in a battle which we lost. But this guy's poem, Brent Scott Key, is that it really doesn't matter because the flag was still there. Look at his priorities, will you? <laughs> the fort was pulverized. Everyone in it was dead. <laughs> but he thinks we won because the flag was still there the next morning. <laughs> and the English were glad to hear that. They lost that battle. They used to be able to... It, it was inter you couldn't interpret it without great risk to your prestige or something else. Now everyone does it their own way. This country way of doing it. Oh, say, can you? <laughs> Nightclub layback. Oh, say. In, Holland, in California, the World Series, they always have people who... Oh, say. But the first person to ever have the balls to interpret it, and beautifully, was Jose Feliciano in the um, World Series a few years ago. Do you remember? It was Baltimore, Pittsburgh, I think. And there he is sitting in acoustic guitar at second base on a stool there, and the announcer doesn't even know his name. And now, ladies and gentlemen, man, 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 I call your attention to second base, there's to Mr. Josie Feliki Nuno. Cool thing, the national anthem, 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 Mr. Licky Nuno, no, no. And then he shocked everyone. Oh, say, 
Mira que no te iba a dar No me iba a dar No me iba a dar La bravest thing I ever saw Figured they wouldn't kick the shit out of him Because he was blind Which was a correct calculation incidentally Because I know Jose well And he got a few hate letters to Puerto Rican People have strange priorities of their own You know